And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane. We're here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona and what is going on with this spring. We've got uh, things are late. They are waking up late, although it seems like this week everything decided to uh, just take off all at once. And so the forsythia are just glorious. Oh my goodness. The purple leaf plums, they've been in bloom for two, 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 three weeks, depending on what elevation you're at. Uh, they're starting to put their purple foliage on, which is beautiful. That pink flower against the purple foliage is magnificent. It'll hold that purple foliage right through the growing season. And then next eh, October, first part of November, they'll start to go into fall color and their fall color is purple. It's a purple leaf plum. That's kind of what you're going to get year round. So the white one you're seeing right now, it is stunning in full bloom. That is a Bradford pear or flowering pear. Uh, there's quite a few different flowering pears. They all kind of are similar. So Bradford's the old fashioned one. You've got Chanticleer, Capital, Aristocrat, and I'm sure there's other Jack pears. There's quite a few others. They're all, they don't put a pear or fruits on. They're just pretty in the spring with these white flowers. They've got this beautiful uh, um, uh, kind of a, a silver dollar size leaf that's glossy, deep, rich green, very good shade tree. And then it's the last tree to turn red in the fall of the year. And so it's just got a lot going on for it. If you're in a zone six, seven, eight, it's just fantastic. It's a great uh, shade kind of tree. And it's not so overpowering that uh, it takes over your whole yard. And so it's a good medium size shade tree that blooms in the spring, flowering pear. And so it'll get up maybe 35 feet tall. Whereas a sycamore, a cottonwood, a willow, they're like 70, 80 or plus feet tall. They're huge. And so sometimes they're too big for smaller yards. Uh, so you need, this is a better one. Uh, a purple leaf plum, I mentioned that. I should mention the size. That one's going to get up 20 feet. Yeah, high teens. So it's a small tree. It's an ornamental tree. That is, it doesn't actually put on plums, a purple leaf plum. It doesn't put fruits on, or rarely does. But it's just made to be a beautiful vase-shaped tree that's an accent in the yard that you go down a driveway off a patio, accented the back corner of a, a, back, a tight backyard. That's where it's beautiful. I tell you where I design purple leaf plums into when I'm helping clients here at, at Waters Garden Center. I will actually place those in between like native trees. They look really good, that purple in between, let's say the blue of, of, a, of a, a native oak tree, an emery oak or a scrub oak. It's quite striking. It's like a little oasis in between the, the manzanitas. It's a, the, the ceanothus, a wild ketoniaster. It just pops up and goes, look, I'm alive. This yard is vibrant and beautiful. Don't you want to live here? Well, the answer is yes. And I'll sip a glass of wine while I'm watching the sunset. The butterfly is going by. That's how you design well in amongst the, the native boulders, the native shrubs. Uh, we call that oasis gardening. So as you feather out into the yard, it's rough, it's, it's native, it's kind of scrubby looking sometimes. As you get closer to your gardens where you enjoy your gardens, you are you create the, the, the more lush things, the things that might take a little more care, a little more water, a little more nutrients, but it's beautiful. So it's like a you know, little oasis around your back patio as you're looking at that so that vista off your back deck. You bring things in tighter that are, that's where you put your flowers. That's where you put your vegetable gardens. It's closer, so it's easier to get to, easier to water, and it just feels good. And then as you go feather out against into that native yard, then you go, then you kind of go in with the scrub oaks and the pinion pines and the ponderosas and the junipers. So there's a way to design that. And that's what we do. Basically, we come to work and I'm giddy. When I get really stressed, I go out on the sales floor and I just kind of go, how can I help you design? Because it's fun. So it's just in my head, it's, a, it's an artistic exercise. Going, how, do, how can I help customers plug, the, make their yard beautiful? 
and easier to grow. So there's a technique to it. Why are things a little late coming out? Because it's just been downright cold. And so the temperature is one of the variables that your plants use to go, I'm not quite ready to wake up yet. They, they're, they've got some triggers that kind of go, oh, it's still too cold. And it's their sap is not flowing. It's just it, they're in stasis. And so all of a sudden it got up to 70 degrees. And it just went, the sap started flowing. The, the roots are now taking things up. And it just erupts with flowers, erupts with foliage. Things just happen really quick. If things haven't quite started yet in your yard, give it time. It's still very early. Things, some things are very late to wake up. Crate myrtles have no interest whatsoever in spring. They, they want summer. They want it to be 100 degrees. They like that. They want it to be warm and hot. They're going to sit there without foliage going, I am just not warm enough. I'm not doing this yet. Have you got to relatives? Like it's uh, 80 degrees out. And they still have a parka on. Well, that's what a crepe myrtle is. That's what a, a, a smoke tree, a desert willow. There's a whole series of summer plants. Russian sage has no interest in coming out yet. So it's waiting, it's sitting in, it's in the corner of the, of the gardens going, I'm just too cold yet. The other one that triggers plants, that ignites them, is how long the days are. And so as the days get longer and longer, so every day you're adding about three and a half minutes in the morning, three and a half in the afternoon, about seven minutes a day, the, the days get longer. And so plants know, oh, once I see it bright enough, long enough, I think I'll start to thinking about waking up. And so as the days get longer, they will actually wake up more. And so the other one is soil temperature. And this one we don't really um, think about that often. When the soil is cold and wet and soggy and it's just still frozen, plants are not going to wake up. Their feet are cold. So you might be able to sunbathe in a in a in a snow pile. Uh, but if your if your feet are in the cold, in the ice, in an ice bucket, you're gonna be cold. Well, those your plants are the same way. They they don't mind sunbathing up top, but when their feet are stuck in cold ground, they are gonna they're gonna wait till the sun warms up that earth and then it will start taking off. So you've got soil temperature, how long the days are. How, how warm it is. And it's not really warm during the day. It's how warm the nights are. That's what plants are counting on. When the nights are warm enough, they're going, eh, I'm going to wake up. I'm going to go now. Now, some plants, they don't take that long. They kind of go, yeah, I'm good. Good enough. It's 55 degrees out. Let's go. And those are things like your crocus, daffodils, peony, carnations, pansies, there's a whole series of spring bloomers that just, they love, every, they like cold soil, they like cold nights, they like short days, they're happy with spring. You want to plant those things in the spring. Summer things, you know, wait, you don't feel pressured. You know, right now, the lilacs, they're kind of this in-between. They'll, they'll wait a little bit till we get into spring, but they're they're not quite happy with, they don't want to bloom in the summer. They like this transition. So they're starting to bloom right now. In fact, if you wanted to shop for lilacs, this is your time because you can see the color on the foliage. You can see the color on the flowers. You can smell the buds as they open up. The negative is as soon as a lilac opens up here at the garden center, it sells like that. I mean, we're talking, it opens this morning. It'll be on a shopping cart in two hours, just like that. But you kind of get a feel for it. You're starting to see them really take off. So roses came in this week. Beautiful roses. Fragrant roses came in this week. And so they, these are ones that they've been leafing out really since late February for the last month, four, six weeks. They've been going. Well, now we've got some from the farm. They're in full bloom. And they're just exciting. They kind of announce spring. They kind of go, it's here. But that's the reason things are a little delayed. Don't lose your head if your plants have not quite woken up yet. I, I'm encouraging you folks, fertilize them, water them, and then wait, wait till at least to the end of the month. Wait, before you rip them up out of the ground, I, and I want to sell you a new plant, but I would still encourage you before you rip your yard up, just see if it'll wake up, fertilize the water, and see what happens in a couple of weeks. You'll know pretty quick. Okay, that's it for this segment. Be right back with Lisa Waters Lane with your garden questions. 
right after this. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. Welcome, Lisa, to the show. Thank you. Good so uh, how is the uh, garden center looking? It looks bright, cheery, lots of uh, fragrance. The lilacs mm -hmm. bloomed this week. The lilacs this week. are blooming. A lot of the uh, ornamental tree or flowering trees are blooming. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of nice perennials, roses coming in. So, yeah, we've been stocking up. I know Amy brought in the, our buyer for uh, trees and shrubs. She brought in some uh, roses. We put them out front. We get this pergola in the front parking lot. Just a real pretty place. It says, welcome. We put roses out there because they smell good. They look good. And uh, as soon as she put them out there, they were sold. They were gone. <laughs> so she's getting a lot more. And I think we've got uh, several like waves of them mm -hmm. coming right now because they're inspiring. Yeah. Definitely, definitely need a rose in your yard you or do. in your pot or wherever. What kind of garden questions do we have? Sure. So first I have an alert. Oh, here we go. So it's we had that really cold spring. It's starting to warm up now. So some of those insects are starting to show up yeah. that haven't shown up yet. So I had a gal in yesterday. She brought me this really weird, ugly, she thought it was fungus. Yeah. And actually, it is scale. Yeah. And it was yeah. around her pine trees. And I told her what it was and the product to treat it with. And she came back in today and she said, thank you so much. That's awesome. She said, I found more when I went looking. I found more and I did what you said. I put them in bags and I threw them in my trash and I got rid of them. So the scale are definitely out. So if you're in those pine areas, um, get out there in your yard and look for the scale. It looks like a sawdusty, gooey weird it's an egg sac it's a scale egg sac so you want to look for those yeah the pinion pine specifically the mm -hmm. native pinions so if you're in that area they love eating those and what they do is it's a little tiny you can hardly see them there's a crawler stage right, where they'll like crawl up and down the tree uh, but uh, they're crawl they just hatched or they they ate out of their egg case or their shell their scale from the outer branches and now they've crawled down to the base of the tree and they'll congregate right there where the where the soil meets the trunk or the major crotches uh, of the tree you'll be able to see them if you if you look you can see them mm -hmm. looks like a white cottony mass with some yellow mucus stuff in it, it is gross, <laughs> gross. so uh g gather those things up because literally there's thousands or more eggs that are going to hatch and they as that tree elongates and puts on new needles they crawl they hatch they crawl right up and attach themselves and they literally will suck the needle dry mm -hmm. suck the, the life forces out of that tree and it dies of starvation uh, the needles are taken out so they cannot create the tree can't create photosynthesis right. and so it literally will starve to death mm -hmm. so if your trees look thin and wispy well they've been attacked by scale for years look at those yeah a walk around <clears throat> those. Uh, and then you should fertilize those trees. Mm -hmm. Put the all-purpose plant food down. That'll help it elongate and get longer needles. And then you can collect these egg masses up. You'll never get them all. So you're still going to have to spray and treat. And mm -hmm. if you see that, I would say gather that up, get it off of your property, throw them in, in the trash, and then fertilize a tree. And then treat the tree with systemic drench mm -hmm. so there's a tree and shrub systemic drench ask where it's just like that mm -hmm. uh, we've got a really good one here at, at the garden center put together by fertilone so we're kind of one of the owners or it's a co-op where we partner and we create these products and so fertilone tree and shrub drench is the product mm -hmm. for scale i mean bar none it just yeah. it is going to treat that new growth coming out for a year mm -hmm. keeps them off and if you see this, this is something you're probably going to have to do every year. Put it on well, calendar. I did. I did this last <laughs> year. Well, you're going to be doing it every year, or your tree will die. I'm telling you, yeah. entire tracks of these pinion pines have been obliterated. Entire neighborhoods—they've all died because the scale took them out. So put it on your radar. It's good to know. I did treat. Yeah. I helped one customer last week, so mm. I knew it was coming. But now it sounds like the tidal out. wave. Yeah. It's hit. So. so just wanted people to be aware of that. But let's move Good. on to our questions. Our first one is from Shelby in Prescott Valley. She wants to know what's that pretty yellow shrub blooming around town, and uh, what does it do the rest of the year? 
So Shelby, great question. So they all erupted at all elevations <laughs> this week. I don't know where Shelby's from, but probably in the heart of Prescott or the Prescott Ridge Valley. Lines. Prescott Valley. Okay, gotcha. Um, for Scythia, mm -hmm. like four, the number four, Scythia. It's a shrub that, that just it grows wild here. It's just great. Antelope don't eat it in Prescott Valley. Deer, javelina, they all leave them alone. Mm -hmm. It's this pretty shrub that grows naturally up to about head height. Yeah, you can keep it trimmed down to, to hip high or so, chest high. But it naturally, just let it go, head height or a little above. Nice, thick, rounded shrub. Looks it looks handsome no matter what you do. Just looks good. Nice and thick. And so it is a deciduous tree. That is, it loses its fall. Its fall color is aspen gold, usually in October, first part of November. Then it has this interesting structure through winter, forms its flowers. Then in spring, it erupts with this yellow flower, golden, like bright solar yellow flower. And then it will start, it'll bloom maybe three, four weeks like that. Then it will start to put on some foliage. And so then you'll get another two, three weeks of foliage and and flowers. And then it had just this real pretty dark green, balanced, dark, green. rich green foliage mm -hmm. that uh, easily blocks out neighbors, uh, defines walkways, mm -hmm. It's a good plant for here, mainly because it's so drought hardy, yeah. animal hardy, sun hardy, wind hardy. It's got all the hardy things you want. So for Scythia, it's a great also, plant. It announces spring. That's it does. my favorite thing about it is yeah. it announces spring. Yeah. Also, if you don't think, I don't want a head high shrub and I don't want to have to prune it. We actually do. There's varieties that come in about the four foot range. Yeah. And there's actually one that comes in about the two foot range. So we've got one for wherever you need in your yard. Absolutely. Yeah. So good. And a companion plant to that. Lilacs, because yep. it's always forsythia lilac, just like yeah. that. Bump, bump, and so you get you can you can extend that bloom cycle mm -hmm. right through the end of spring just by Definitely. having those two shrubs in your yard uh, can 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 fill up a landscape with spring blooms. Right. I agree. All right, next question is from Andy and Chino. So he said he didn't get his pre-emergent down in time. Ooh, Andy, but now Andy, he's Andy. got the filigree and the foxtail <laughs> yeah, and the loco does. weed. <laughs> and he wants to know what's the best product uh, to use at this time of year to kill those weeds. Andy, don't. I We've been preaching for three months. Put your pre-emergence down. Andy, it just, you knew it was coming. It was so such a wet spring. Oh, what to do? Well, first start with, Put your pre-emergent down. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to come right back. Yeah. I can show you how to kill what's there, but it, it'll come right back. So the seed, every seed is going to germinate this spring. I mean, all of them. It's going to overwhelm your gardens with weeds, wildflowers, with everything. So mm -hmm. put the pre-emergent. So there's a tree and a weed and grass preventer. You spread it like fertilizer mm -hmm. throughout the yard. It'll keep the seed from germinating. So you got to start with that. Now, his actual question. In Chino Valley, how do I keep the weeds that are already up there from, how do I kill them? There's only one that I would recommend right now because it's still cool at night. Mm -hmm. You have to use decimate. That's how you just decimate. It's a liquid. It's a competitor to Roundup, but it works when the nights are real cool. And it's far safer. It doesn't, it's not a glyphosate. It's not going to cause you know, boils to come out of your back because you've been spraying Roundup. I mean, Roundup is dangerous. Folks, don't use that stuff. It's just, you're going to get cancer. It's just a matter of time. Decimate doesn't do that. And so it's, it's it kills better, faster in the spring when it's real cool and in the fall. In the summer, almost anything. Will, I mean, everything will kill stuff in the summer. Roundup only works really in the summer. And that's it. It's a summer plant, summer killer. So decimate, I would add now for sure. Here's how you, here's the magic. Add a spreader sticker to the decimate in the same tank sprayer and you will get a knockdown. And we were talking by the end of the day, some of these plants are going to be wilting. We just, you put those two combos, the spreader sticker gets it to adhere and, and kill the, the, the foliage faster. Mm -hmm. And then the decimate goes through the entire root zone and, and kills everything off. So that's how you come see us more, Andy. I mean, that's, we can show you how to kill weeds. It's going to be a blockbuster weed year. Oh my gosh. Ken Elisa Lane, the mountain gardeners be right back after this. So the growing season really is the start of whenever you see those daffodils start to bloom, the forsythias are going, uh, roses are definitely leafing out. You're seeing your willows starting to put on foliage. These are all indicators that spring's here. 
that should be a cue. Okay, that's going to happen in April. Almost every spring is going to happen sometime in April. Okay, then that's the start of the growing season. And then when does it end? Well, when you start to see those things have fall colors, your aspens are starting to show fall color, that aspen gold. The mums are 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 in bloom. Your the pumpkins are out. You're decorating for the fall season. That's the growing season. So April through about eh, the end of October, first part of November, depending on your elevation and where you're at. During that time, when you start to see those first flowers bloom, you need to be watering. Irrigation is important. So if you don't irrigate while things are in bloom, they'll it'll shorten the bloom life. Or, or let's say your fruit trees, your uh, peaches and apricots, nectarines, plums, they're starting to form fruits. As they form fruits, it's critical to get that irrigation spot on because if it, if it gets short for just a few days, the plant will start to sacrifice or shed their fruit, shed their flowers because it's conserving the heart of the plant. It's not going to risk dying just, be, just to keep some fruit on. It's going to shed some of those. So it's critical to get those spot on. When your peonies are in bloom, it's important to get those that watering much more accurate so that those flowers will stay on for an extra week or two. And so now is the time to activate the irrigation or to start watering by hand more regularly. And so let's just go over real quick. How often, when should it, that's when, April through October, how often? Well, how, how long should I run that drip irrigation, especially? It's like a mysterious thing. Ah, sip of coffee. There we go. We're ready to go. Irrigation. Uh, so you are watering drip micro irrigation or drip irrigation. So this is usually a one gallon per hour emitter head. That's the industry standard. So that system has to run for an hour and one gallon will come out of that one drip emitter. So a, let's say a 15 gallon tree, they might need 15 gallons of water per week. A seven gallon tree needs about seven gallons of water per, per, per week. Uh, a five gallon tree needs about five gallons. You're getting where I'm going with this, right? So the bigger the tree, the more water it's going to take. So you you very seriously might need to have two or three emitters around the base of that plant to get enough water with, during that time that system is on. So you might run an irrigation system on average an hour and a half, two hours. That's pretty standard because again, you, you need 15 gallons on a bigger tree, you need two or three emitter heads. Let's say you might even upsize up the size. You might go to a two gallon per hour emitter head so that you can get enough water on this thing. Hey, you're trying to push that water down into the garden soil as deep as you can through the root zone and then a little beyond. So we're encouraging those plants to root deep. If you're watering frequently and not very long, what's going to happen is that, let's say you run it for 15 minutes, a drip irrigation system, not, not a flood irrigation or pop-up heads or lawns. We're talking about trees and shrubs that you're watering very efficiently uh, with a drip irrigation system. You'll need to run that thing, push that thing down for a minimum. I mean, if you're doing just 15 minutes, what is that? One gallon per hour emit, emitter head plus 15 minutes equals a quart of water. Very few plants need only a quart of water and they're happy. You're going to need to water more deeper and longer. So that's a big mistake I find rookies make when they come into this, a drier or more a new, new subdivision where they require drip irrigation. They just don't know how to set it. And so they'll run it every day. Plants don't want water every day. They want a lot of moisture. They don't want to, they want to dry out in between the next water cycle. Otherwise, they can literally drown. Literally, if you, you can drown in a heavy clay soil, you're more likely to kill a plant by overwatering it than underwatering it. So especially if you're watering every day for an hour, that's too much. I'd say gather up all that water, hit trees and shrubs, big vines. They're going to want water typically one, maybe two times per week. And that's enough. Then, then let it dry out in between. Now, that's not the way you do lawns, flowers, vegetables, things with a shallow root structure, they dry out faster. And so you might be watering my containers right now, I'm watering every five days. So just two, three times. And as it warms up to get to 80 degrees, I might bump it to 
every three days. When we're in the peak of summer, it might be every day. I'll monitor my plants and get a feel for it. I'll, I'll adjust that clock accordingly. And so and you can do the same. So again, if you have trouble with that or you're just not sure, come visit me at the garden center. I will be glad to spend, I mean, all of our nursery professionals, they are trained on how to water. And they've got a water guide. Every business card has got, it's the number one question we get. How often should I water? It's on the back of my card. I'll give you one. It's made to be, make it easy. Put it in your garden journal. Tape it inside your irrigation box. But trees and shrubs, not once a week, an hour and a half, two hours for the drip system. Just let them, just hydrate them and make them happy. Okay, we'll be back right after this. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week and we just give this segment to her to share a different perspective, a softer perspective, more beautiful perspective. Hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. No pressure. Oh, so inspire <laughs> us all. <laughs> okay. uh, plus, it's just a, just good to have all these shows, all these radio shows, all these podcasts are just one guy on there going, well, let me tell you, some farmer Joe, who's telling you how to garden agriculturally <laughs> for the best grape production or more tomatoes per acre. And that's not who's tuned in here. These are backyard I call them yardeners. They're gardening in the yard, and they just kind of they they're yardening. It's not I just made that word up, but uh, it's it's not agriculture. It's not just landscaping. It's want to have a beautiful place. Mm -hmm. and so Definitely. you help us with that. Yeah, I'll try. How? What do you got for us this so, week? The first thing I wanted to hit. I brought some friends in with me today. Some friends. So these are our ladybugs. We Yay! got our ladybugs in. You can't. You can kind of. Let's see if I can get for the, the folks that are tuned in on the traditional radio waves. You're like, what are you can't about? see this, but <laughs> everyone else, the YouTube and yeah. the podcast folks, you can see that. See them all crawling around. Yeah. Is that cool? So oh we my gosh. definitely got our ladybugs in. We also have um, worms. So if you want some worms for your soil, and we are also getting the praying mantis in as well. So just really nice beneficials to put out in your yard, help take care of aphids and other insects. Huh. Um, so just a good one to have around. So we do have them in. <laughs> I'm trying to read. There's a lot of ladybugs. I, I, I would think they would count them, name them, and put barcodes <laughs> on them or something. But there's got to be. There's hundreds of ladybugs in hundreds here. Ladybugs and it says there. release them in the evening. Right. So that is a mm -hmm. secret. So you put them out when it's dark because mm -hmm. ladybugs don't fly at night. They only fly during the day. Mm -hmm. And so you put them out there in the evening. And they stick around mm -hmm. where the plant is. And they eat their way through the aphids and thrip and that yeah. kind of stuff. And then in the morning, they're gone. They'll stay there until all the food's gone. And they have wings. And they fly off. They're looking right. for the next food source. Right. And they don't do it in a colony. They do it individually. Right. So they're off. They just scatter by themselves. They'll lay some eggs. You'll get some uh, some of the larva stage, which is like this dragon-looking yeah, thing. It's funky. pretty cool. Okay. Yep. So anyway. Anywho, even if they don't, they're not going to always stay in your yard. But hey, you're doing great things for the environment because they're going to go to your neighbors and the neighbor neighbors. So a great one to put out. I would say yard. they do stay in your yard. Everyone just wants them to congregate like a... So they see them all at one Yeah, time. they want to see them all together. <laughs> but you, for sure, if you release ladybugs in your yard, you will see ladybugs the rest of the year. You'll just see them onesie twosies. Not, right. They'll be the light on your shoulder at a barbecue. <laughs> but they're not going to do it as a horde, as a cohort. Well, thank heavens. <laughs> That would, be that would be that'd be funky. Anyway. They are cool. Anyway. Yeah. So this week, of course, the forsythia bloomed out. So everybody's seen those around town. In our um, nursery yard, in the store yard, the lilacs are starting to bloom. Yeah. So I just trimmed. I trimmed oh, the blossom. Oh, you did not off cut of that off. I did. Oh, it that's a That's so a $40, $50 good. plant we could have sold. Well, it's but now you cut the flower in off. about 20 blossoms, so I cut <laughs> one off because I wanted to bring it in and show. This is Old Glory. Um, you can tell it's that dark purple. Yeah, it. it's pretty. Oh, it smells, smells wonderful. So Entire good. studio it smells delicious. So right now we have the Old Glory, which you can see is that kind of deep, deep purple. We have Pocahontas, which is kind of a maroon purple. Blue skies, which is kind of a light purple. 
Uh, but they're all either just budding, <laughs> they're pretty. bloom budding out, or they're like in days they're going to be doing it. Uh, so you got to come in, even if you don't want a lilac, come in and smell. Yeah, it's the inspiring. Lilacs. It's kind of like very a rose. Inspiring. So now we should describe this a little bit for those okay. folks that maybe are listening to the podcast or just the airwaves. Okay. Uh, this is a flower that's probably seven, eight inches long. It's pinnacle in shape. It's got these spires to it. Mm -hmm. It's covered in flowers. Probably this one. What is that branch mm -hmm. has got 40 or 50 flowers on it. Each one's about the size of just smaller than a dime. And as it opens, this fragrant just emits mm -hmm. uh, throughout the entire landscape. So this will fill up an entire patio mm -hmm. or entire entrance or front yard, just one plant. Yeah. We've got them in white, purple, yes, blues. Variegated. Uh, variegated. Yeah, the sensation, sensation is this red is with a white favorite. variegation. Mm -hmm. um, they all smell good. Mm -hmm. And then there's, this is the big one. So Old Glory is a big lilac. It gets, oh, easily, uh, yeah, head high plus, maybe mm -hmm. as far, eight, 10 feet. Yeah. Ten's a bit optimistic. About eight, eight, nine feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's dwarf varieties that have the same color variations, reds mm -hmm. and purples, uh, pinks, uh, and they stay about hip high. Right. And the flower's about half of this size. So it'll be mm -hmm. maybe four or five inches long instead of seven or eight but it has more flowers right. covering the plant. Mm -hmm. And many of the dwarf varieties repeat bloom. They come back over and over <laughs> and over throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So, and that's lilacs. Uh, Which are, they're again, animal resistant. They are, correct? yep. yep. Um, the deer, javelina, bunnies, not really gonna mess with them. Yep. They are drought, very drought hardy. hardy. I mean, they got mm -hmm. a tap root. They got a, a real deep root structure, which makes them as hardy as, a Colorado spruce or a, a pine tree. It makes them that that tough, mm -hmm. way hardier, more robust than a birch or an aspen or maples. This, this thing's rough. It's yeah. just tough. It and it blooms. It's it's a beautiful. You really do need them in the yard. And I think you mentioned earlier the forsythia and the lilacs yeah. are great companion plants because that forsythia is going to bloom first. And right on its heels is going to be the lilacs. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got two, three months of just blooming color that's fragrant and lovely. And Who doesn't want that? I don't know. Spring Who fragrance, beauty for, for <laughs> two, three months. I mean, I want I want three of those. Right. So definitely come and check those out. Even if you just don't think, eh, come in and smell them. I You'll can't say better. with lilac, because um, I've killed a couple of them. If you're planting this, it, it it needs a soil that drains. So mm -hmm. if you all are out in that valley area or that hard, compacted clay, get a bag of mulch. Oh, definitely. It's just going to make a difference. You'll just need it. It's You add compost or mulch, premium mulch, to that heavy clay soil. It's going to keep the soil from compacting right back down. You add organics. You're changing the structure of the soil so the roots can get through it. Mm -hmm. So it keeps it lighter and fluffier. If you don't do that, they'll just... It won't die. It just sit there and it won't bloom. It won't die. It won't grow. It just sits there looking at <laughs> you, you go, mocking at wrong? you. If you yeah. want flowers, you've got to make sure this thing, the roots can get out mm -hmm. and you got to fertilize it regularly to get these beautiful fragrant flowers. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And they like the full sun too. So oh yeah. At least six hours. Yeah. Don't be afraid to do that. And then now we also have blooming around town. Some of our blooming trees. Are yeah. So I think the plums, ornamental plums went a couple of weeks ago. They have that light pink blossom. Uh, a lot of the red buds, I can tell, I mean, they're eh, close to right, popping. Yeah, right there. Um, crab apples have started oh, to pretty. bloom. So I brought in, this is called spring snow crab apple. It's a white crab apple. Uh, does it smell good? Too. It does, yeah. yeah. So, you can tell if it's a lilac or the crab apple. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the spring snow crab. This one's a little smaller. It's great for those small yards. It's about 15 feet tall perfect for those small yards um or you just want to sneak one in it's a great one <laughs> also in bloom are the radiant crab apples which have a really dark pink blossom to them uh royal raindrops which is a oh deep that's pretty magenta royal raindrops yeah. one of my favorite they're also in bloom uh just simply gorgeous trees low maintenance trees um maintain they don't you're not gonna have to do a lot of trimming shaping pruning on them uh and they like it here they like our area so definitely ones to be looking for to put in uh, i should have clipped more but you always get mad no no this is like <laughs> uh yeah this is this is so it's kind of fun so so we're starting to do the radio show in front of a camera mm -hmm. so it's just kind of that's the thing to do now so okay we'll try it 
but uh, it's fun talking on the radio with uh, on the airwaves with uh, a video camera. You could just play with the plants and you're jumping across <laughs> the screen. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's not it's fragrant. At all. <laughs> <laughs> <I> know, <yeah. laughs> no. So lots of really cool things in bloom. A lot of the. Uh, Candy tuff and the perennials are out and blooming. Dianthus, oh my gosh, they're going crazy yeah, they're right going nuts. now. So a lot Tis of things are just going, oh, spring's here. Now I'm ready to go. Well, Lisa, thank you for sharing the spring blooming things you can have in your, you plant your yard right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken and Lisa Lane, the mountain gardeners, come see us at Waters Garden Center. We'll show you firsthand what we've been talking about. Be right yeah. back. I got to tell you, it's really difficult to have your garden soil ready and just sit there. I mean, you get the soil ready, it's nutrients are there, it just looks so lush, it's weed free. There's no leftover plants from last season. It's ready to be planted, but the plants may not be right. It's just, there's a season for it. And so I've been holding off, holding off, holding off. But uh, this weekend, I'm going to put some vegetables in the ground, mainly summer things. So I've got my walls of water, or they call them plant protectors. There's these little mini teepees. You fill up with water. They collapse around the plant. They keep it warm. They make them happy. So no matter if we get some cold yet, or if we go below, I mean, tomato, it does not like to be below 50 degrees. I mean, if you are cold outside at two o'clock in the morning, so is a tomato. Peppers aren't quite as finicky. Eggplants are, are even more finicky. So it's certain plants just really like the summer. They, they don't like cold nights. They want to be warm. And so those things, I'm planting a few right now. And I'm putting my plant protectors over them. And that protects them. It does a couple things. It warms up the soil. So it they really start rooting quickly. I mean, like right now, they'll outpace your neighbors that that didn't do that easily. The folks that have greenhouses, it kind of competes with them. So if you've got a greenhouse, you know how quickly you can get things started. Well, with these plant protectors, even without a greenhouse, you can do the same thing. And so I've had some that are, I must have some that are 10 years old. I keep reusing them. They look kind of skanky, dirty. They got some algae growing in them. Again, they're tubes that you fill with water. And I try to get them to dry out, but uh, I don't care how they look. I'm only going to keep them on for a month. I'm going to pull them back off the plant and just let the tomatoes run rampant. I'm going to let cucumbers just go crazy. I'm going to let the squash just bulk up in May. So sometime middle of May, I'll pull them off and go, ah, it's good. It's been a good ride. But by then, They've quadrupled in size. So I'm going to put a few things in. I would not do that for strawberries. I would not do that for lettuce. I would not do it for anything that's a cool season plant. Only use plant protectors. Only grow in a greenhouse things that like the summer. I would not put strawberries into, I wouldn't put peas in a greenhouse. They like the coolness. They want it to be cooler. So let them just go. So peas, like the spring, beans do not. Beans like warm soil. They like growing up fence poles and, and bamboo structures. They like growing up things when it's summer. They're a summer plant. Peas are a spring plant. So frequently I'll plant my peas fully knowing that they're going to produce. I'm going to be harvesting those by the end of May. I will purposely pick off the beans, rip those things out of the ground, and I'll put my beans in that same spot right afterwards. So you get a crop rotation. It's called square foot gardening, getting more production out of a tight space. And it's very easy to do. You just got to know which ones to put in and just which ones do you start first in spring, usually in March, and which ones do you wait to start until May? So there's a, there's a seasonality. So look for your frost date. So it, no matter where you're tuned in from here, it's White Mountains to Flagstaff to, to Sedona to, I mean, here in the Central Highlands, this this uh, this area, Prescott Valley, Chino Valley, uh, Pr Prescott, I'd say, I would say spilling over to, really, Camp Verde, Cottonwood, Kirkland, Skull Valley, those areas, I would say you all are, you're a zone seven. You flirt, quite a few of you, with zone eight. And so your frost date typically is going to be sometime that first week in May. Maybe it's the last week in April. Yeah, you're okay. So Prescott's the coldest, the May 8th. 
Prescott Valley, you all have got it so easy because your your frost dates earlier. It's May like seventh or sixth. So you're like you're two days earlier. So yeah, a hundred years of data. You you get two. It's still the last frost date is May sixth. Prescott's May eighth. So it just depends. I tell you what fools you. So we farmed, I raised my family in Skull Valley of all places, Skull, like S-Q-L-L, Skull Valley. It's a little ranch town. And so it's mainly ranching and farming. And so we raised our family on a 10 acre farm and we had greenhouses and we grew lots of our plants that we have here. And so there, that cold air would settle off of the top of uh, a copper basin, that, that copper basin road, that, that cool air spills right on top every evening. It would really cool down so you could feel the cold air settle. And you'll notice that in your own neighborhood. You'll find that that dry wash where you were at, uh, that cold air kind of settles. And when you walk your neighborhood, you'll feel the warm air rise, cool air kind of settle. And so that can affect your yard as well. So just keep that in mind. Another one that I find really helps uh, you folks on the east exposure, the east side of the hill, the east vistas. You've got some of the best gardening ever because that sun pops up and warms those gardens up quicker than, let's say, someone on a north slope. That's kind of where I'm at. It's cold. I mean, the snow just did melt off those gardens. And so uh, whereas the south facing uh, hillsides, you've been thawed for a month. So it just depends. Those those are variables that, that can affect your we call those microclimates. And so that affects when and how you you plant your gardens. Right now, I'm going to put a few things, a few summer plants in my north-facing gardens uh, because I just want to get started. Right here, I've got a radio show podcast. So I'm writing garden columns, <laughs> bragging rights. Let's face it. Gardeners like to talk about at, at cocktail parties. They're going to get together in June and go, oh, you know, I just picked my first tomato. How are you doing with your gardens? And you're going to go, oh, I'm just not a very good gardener. It's because we cheated. We started early with a few key plants. If you start with smaller tomatoes. So cherry tomatoes are going to come off that plant much faster than, let's say, a beefsteak or, or a, a brandy wine. These great big slicers. You're not going to get anything off of those until August. I mean, come on. They just it takes so long to produce a giant fruit. And so I'll plant a few things early so I can describe over the airwaves to you all going, oh my gosh, that tomato, that cucumber just melted. It was so crunchy. It tasted so good. How are you doing on your gardens? So some of that bragging rights. I don't go all in. So I'm, I do secession planning. This is something we probably ought to cover. So you don't want to put all of your radishes in all at once, or you'll have so many you know what to do with. You plant some of your seeds some a row of that vegetable garden and you hold some in reserve so you can start in another couple of weeks you'll start another section of carrots you'll start another section of beans another section of so you've got this succession planning so there's always a crop rotation coming off out of that gardens that way you're not overwhelmed with so much vegetables so many vegetables you don't have to plant all at once you can do it in waves or in groups or in said you can do it in succession planting. And so it's very famous for root crops. So radishes are like the number one because you can have too many radishes, but not if you're planting every couple of weeks, you just plant a few more seed. And so you're always opening up uh, a vegetable part of your gardens for more coming off that garden. I'm doing the same thing with some of my bigger plants. So I'll do that with my my tomatoes. I love tomatoes. I'm a salsa gardener. I love cilantro, tomatoes, onions, uh, some of the herbs, fresh, fresh oregano, uh, fresh uh, parsley. These are all things that are just, they melt in your mouth and they make everything taste better. So I'm, I'm putting together some of those plants in now, but I'm not, I'm not under pressure. I won't get it all planted until the end of May. Then the entire gardens will be packed. Things will start producing. Uh, the cucumbers and beans are starting to grow at that point. Uh, the, I'm pretty much done with the broccoli. I'm freeing up that space for squash. So I'm doing square foot gardening. So I've got raised beds and containers. So I've got, I've got to be efficient with when and how I plant those things. I've got many perennial varieties, lots of uh, perennial like uh, asparagus. 
it stays where it's at, comes up every year. My herbs, the, the oregano is perennial. You plant it once and you're done. It comes for years. Rosemaries, uh, parsley, these are all things you plant once. So I'm, I'm, where do I put those where I can keep them? What do I plant now that I want to harvest and then free up space later? So the tall things like corn and big, big tomatoes, I'll plant on the north side of my garden so they don't shade some of my smaller things. So some strategies to that. We've got a handout here at the garden center. It's called uh, the vegetable calendar. It's for here. It's when do you plant carrots? When do you plant uh, cucumbers? When do you plant eggplants? It's very helpful. Ask for one. Get your free copy. Be back after this. So the animals have been uh, mischievous in the gardens. They, they're coming in through. Rabbits are getting through gates. Rats are in. Squirrels. A deer, javelina, even the antelope are coming into the valley areas. So I think what's going on is uh, that things have been late to wake up. So they're native things that they naturally like. The, the grasses, the, the different weeds, the different uh, shrubs, they like to nibble on. Let's say deer, uh, they're late to come out. And so they're desperate. They're, it's been cold. It's been a cold winter since October. It has been winter, at least in the mountains areas. So it, it's it's chilly. And they are feeling it. And, and animals generally don't, they have their favorite foods just like you and I do. And they, but they're not going to starve to death. If they don't have those, they're naturally going to graze through and look for other things. And so I've had quite a few folks come in for javelina. This wild pig gets up, you know, just shy of 100, 100 pounds. They can be kind of dangerous for smaller pets, especially. I've had one charge at me personally. Uh, he was just trying to spook me off. I, I stumbled across a herd of javelina, like a large herd. I wasn't paying attention. Duh, I should have been walking across the orchard in the dark. Okay, I should have been aware. They were eating pecans. You could hear the crunching. You could hear them eating pecans, shell and all. Just a whole herd of them, little babies. You know, and, and I stumbled across the board. And he's going, hey, get out of here. Come on. So his hackles go up and start charging me. I'm going, I run like a little girl. Going, I just, I'll give you room. Sorry, I didn't know. Let me get out of your way. So, but he didn't run after me. Uh, first of all, they can't see very well. So they aren't going to go very far. So you just have to get out of their way. So give them room. Don't be right on them. Don't try to go out and pet them. That's like super dangerous. And don't let your pets, smaller pets, go after them. We had great big old farm dogs like, like shepherds and Labradors. They were fine. They'd chase them off. But little guys like Schnauzers and Scotties and little things, and you know, just protect them. Keep them indoors. Uh, admire them from a distance. So how do you keep them out of the gardens? There's real, So there's repellents. Kind of works, but not really. Uh, you go with certain plants they don't care for. That that's you're getting your light years ahead that way. But in years like this year, they're they're eating things they normally don't eat. So I never say javelina proof. I never say rabbit proof. I never say deer proof. I go resistive. Generally, they would rather eat anything besides this. So, but truly, the only truly only way to keep animals out of your gardens, it's a fence. That's the only way, truly in a fence, a greenhouse, a structure, a building, a warehouse, that's gonna keep them out. So for us, we use a six foot cedar fence out of the backyard. Well, rabbits can get underneath it, rats get over it and sometimes, but I've got, a, I've got a trap line with rat traps out there. So I don't have rat and mice problems. A few rabbits every once in a while, but I can, I can keep them out pretty easy. The front yard, our HOA says you can't have a fence in the front yard. And so we don't have a fence. I have an electric wire that goes through and I've put it on a, on a 12 volt transformer. And it only comes on at night when the javelina come out at night. So our nemesis in the front yard is javelina, packs of them. And so I strung a, a, strung a wire about a foot off the ground through the garden, I didn't even enclose it because I don't want people tripping over a wire to get to the front door. I mean, I don't want to, I just kind of, it's common sense stuff. And so I just put it around it I, I, and I turn it on only at night because if my wife's little schnauzer gets nipped, I'm going to hear about it. I don't like that. And I don't want my little dogs getting nipped, although they get trained pretty quick. Don't go near the wire. I'm going to get zipped. It doesn't electrocute them. 
They don't bleed out from their eyes. I mean, it's just kind of, it's just 12 volts. And it, it just kind of shocks me and goes, hey, yeah, go to the neighbors, eat their stuff. So a fence, that's the only way to truly keep animals out of your gardens. And that's it for this week's show. The Mountain Gardener throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. We love talking to fans of the show. Thank <music> you.